Look up the word crazy in the dictionary and you might just find an asterisk beside the definition that says, listen to the Subiquitous podcast featuring Sue Duffield and you'll find out what crazy means. Sue's travelogue journey of unfiltered stories, impossible miracles, and faith-filled fun will be revisited right here. So buckle up and let's get going with this humorous travelogue of an unfiltered saint, Subiquitous. I was born in a generational time warp where the women in my family were strong. Or maybe better stated, they were women of strength. Nothing could shake them, actually. My father's mother, Ann Beatty, who many have said I look like, sound like, at times I even walk and talk alike, whatever. I act more like her than my own mother. Well, she had six miscarriages before my father was born. Six times, failed pregnancies. Talk about the strength it would have taken to get through all of that, I can't even imagine. My Super Sue outlook would have had some difficulty with that one, no doubt. My grandmother also had to lay to rest the love of her life, Joe Beatty, at the age of 56. And as I mentioned, in a previous episode, she also had to endure the likes of alcoholic siblings and living in a parsonage on a preacher's salary with her father being a pastor. And the salary was basically potatoes, farm vegetables, and chicken. But somehow, someway, she taught herself how to play the piano and sing. And because my great-grandfather needed a pianist for his church services, she was hired. (laughs) What a superwoman. In her final days here, though, she died a desolate death in a care facility in South Jersey. And for some reason, I don't know why, my parents just never took us to go see her. Maybe they thought they were protecting us. Maybe they thought my brother and I couldn't handle it. I don't know. But she had all kinds of failures physically, including her liver. But the one thing I remember most when we did visit her, even while her skin color turned this awful bile-like green, she would play the piano and sing for the residents and guests, and it would echo throughout the entire facility. You talk about a superwoman? Absolutely. I can't even begin to compare myself to her in that capacity. I've led a pretty easy life in comparison, but even my superwoman tendencies were tested too when I suffered a miscarriage before both David and Annie were born. And without sharing all the pain here, I will say that it took me on a journey to dig deep in recovery, especially when you'd hear that low-life voice echo in your head, well, you're just like your grandmother, so it seems pretty obvious that if you're built like her, you too will have great difficulty in pregnancy. I really dismissed that voice, and I began to muster up some supernatural strength that I know came from God and not me. I was told by a reputable doctor that I'd be fine to carry on and to heal and let nature take its course in the next several months. And sure enough, The infinite nature of God's course was born on April 11, 1985, and that infinite nature of God's course was named David. (laughs) The most important aspect, though, of being a superwoman is being supernatural. Write that one down. And according to the reality of all that Christ is and all that we can become through him, it's putting on the good stuff God has provided through the knowledge of his word. There are several women in the Old Testament that aren't so well known, but for some reason, I think, are heroes of the faith. We can look at someone like Sirach, who's in the book of Genesis, Numbers, and Chronicles, the daughter of Asher, one of 12 sons of Jacob. Sirach is mentioned by name in three Old Testament genealogies, but not much information is really given about her. But due to her longevity, she lived to know her grandfather Jacob, born around 2000 B.C., and 500 years later, Moses was born in 1500 B.C., Sirach's personal connection with Jacob and the 12 patriarchs gave her importance in later generations. And according to ancient commentaries on Hebrew scripture, Sirach was very beautiful and very wise. 
and it's believed she was asked to break the news to Jacob that his son Joseph was still alive and living in Egypt. And she did this through a song while accompanying herself on a harp. Wow. Then there's another woman. Her name is Aksa, A-K-S-A-H. That's Caleb's daughter in Joshua, Judges, and Chronicles. Caleb was highly respected in the Israelite community. He and Joshua were the two good spies and the only people who survived the entire 40-year trek in the wilderness to enter the Promised Land. All the other Israelites who eventually entered the Promised Land had been born in the wilderness and not in Egypt. And in Joshua chapter 15, 16 through 19, we read that Caleb offered his unmarried daughter, Aksa, as a prize. Hmm. Trophy wife, I guess. <laughs> in Old Testament times, marriages were seen as much more than an alliance between a husband and wife. They were an alliance between two families and often made for political and financial reasons rather than reasons of affection. That wouldn't go over so much today. Othniel was the man who won Aksa's hand, and he later became the first judge of Israel. At some point, Aksa asked her husband, Othniel, to ask Caleb for a field. And she was given a field from her father, but it seems to have been dry and difficult to work with. So Aksa wasn't satisfied. Would you be? No, I wouldn't be either. So she got on her donkey and went to her father herself and asked him for land with springs of water. Smart girl. Caleb agreed. And she got her own piece of workable land and became involved in agriculture, as did the woman in Proverbs 31.16, where Axe's story is repeated again in Judges chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. And thirdly, Shira. Tucked away in a genealogy in 1 Chronicles chapter 7 is this woman named Shira, S-H-E-E-R-A-H, it's not really clear if this woman was the daughter of a man called Bariah, the son of Ephraim, one of the sons of Joseph, or whether she was just the daughter of Ephraim himself, but very few women are named in genealogies because at that time the family line was only traced through the men. So it is significant when a woman is mentioned and even named in one. And Shira was obviously an influential and wealthy woman. She built and established the towns of Upper and Lower Haran. And these towns were built in a strategic location and went on to have a long history. It says that Shira even built a town that bears her own name, and she was probably a leader of the town she established. She's just one example of an Old Testament woman who had a prominent position of authority, a superwoman with influence, and as with all other Bible women with authority, there is no hint that this was inappropriate or improper or that anyone had a problem with it. There are many women in the Bible who showed resourcefulness, initiative, and influence. Boy, do I want that. Super Sue is crying out for that. Some of these women seem obscure to us, but they were far from obscure to the people of their time. They were rock stars. These Bible women, which included Sarah or Shirash and Aksa and Shira, were prominent super women with super clout. But you're probably saying right now, I don't really see myself through the eyes of clout and even faith or any kind of supernatural thing. You may even be saying, uh, you know, someone else. Uh, they're, they're, they're the blessed ones, you know, the Karens of the world. Well, after all, you are living in the real world, created by all the choices you've made, some being tinged with bitter regret. But not to mention that the people living in your house are far from perfect. You know that, right? So in actual fact, the glories of God's word are more like a beautiful fantasy to put off until eternity right? Some of us feel that way, and I haven't been living on easy street either since I began my journey of faith more than six decades ago. At times, the remarkable answers to prayer I experience and the astounding, even flawless way that life's circumstances play out simply takes my breath away. We talk about that, especially the last two years. And then at other times, 
Life hits like a punch in the gut, leaving me in a different kind of breathless altogether. You know, for me, marriage and child rearing and even this faith venture that we continue on. I like what Luke 145 says, blessed is she that believed and believed and believed and believed <laughs> against all odds, despite how she feels. Because living by faith is a daily process of applying one's active faith again and again, tirelessly, in order to experience a performance of those things which were told from the Lord. Wow. That's super Sue, man. That's the supernatural way that I want to live. You know, when Mary said yes, agreeing to bear the Savior, it wasn't just one decision. It was the one decision that led to all others determining the course of her destiny. It was a yes, not only to carrying a miracle baby, but also to carrying a stigma her entire life. Jesus was born a stumbling block, creating controversy wherever he went. And he died a criminal's death, placing Mary in a position that drew harsh criticism and loud public opinion until the day she left the planet. Surely Mary had to apply very intentional faith to her circumstances, not just once during her encounter with the angel, but repeatedly throughout her journey on earth. It wasn't easy. Well, maybe it was easy to say yes when angels visited her during prayer. But then comes Monday. Girls, I got to tell you, are we truly faith-filled women or women with little faith? One-minute devotions may do the trick for some, but I got to tell you, it's more 24-7 when it comes to living that supernatural life. Women of faith choose victory every single day. It's my only option. I hold fast to that promise of 2 Corinthians 2.14, Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. I'm determined that shouts of joy and victory will resound in my home daily. Because as an obedient child of God, according to Psalm 1.3, Every little thing I do is going to prosper. That has to be number one. And women of faith are sustained by God's word. I love when days feel more like oatmeal than manna, <laughs> but I cling to it nonetheless. And by faith, I proclaim how sweet are the words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. If God's word isn't richly dwelling in us, according to Colossians 3.16, we are malnourished and weak with very little hope of walking in victory. I love this one too. And blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord from Luke 1 45. So rather than asking God for superhuman strength to stay alive, I'm asking God like trust for supersized faith to thrive. Should I say that again? <laughs> You might want to write it down. Rather than asking God for superhuman strength to stay alive, I ask for God-like trust and supersized faith to thrive. That's Super Sue right there. There is no shortage of books on popular culture and Christianity. From Harry Potter to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, authors have offered their insights on Christian faith through the lens of popular culture, and they're going to do it to the day we die. It wouldn't surprise me that one day we see the gospel according to Wonder Woman on the shelves one day. Who knows? You just might be that unsung hero of that story. But again... Asking God for superhuman strength is nothing compared to asking God for his trust and the supersized faith that only God can give to thrive and not just be alive. 
This ubiquitous podcast continues to reach a whole new audience every week, and I am thrilled how God is using this platform to reach a very unique audience. I'm grateful for your giving and for your monetary gifts just to keep us going and growing. Join me on SueDuffield.com and subscribe both to this podcast as well as signing up for our mailing list right there on the main page of SueDuffield.com. We always, always, always welcome your comments and encouragement, but especially we thank you for your prayers as we consistently forge brand new territory with both the Subiquitous podcast and also Couch to Kitchen concert series on YouTube and Facebook every Thursday night. You can find all this information, all about that, on that first page on SueDuffield.com. Again, I say to you, supersize me. (laughs) Well, at the same time, Super Sue would rather ask God for super human godlike trust to thrive rather than just stay alive and join me on this venture. It's a good one. We'll see you next week.